Trinity County hard, but now compared to local businesses for cold conditions. And a shuffling of elected positions coming to the North State next year that could include Anderson City Councilwoman Melissa Hunt. We've got the details. Plus, that Gateway Unified special meeting underway. A live look, the latest updates. All that and more starts right now. This is KRCR News Channel 7 at 6.30, the North State's News. Snow, snow, and snow. Here's a time lapse of Shasta County South Fork's lookout camera, courtesy of PG&E. Looking at the Whiskey Town Reservoir. A lot of water down there. That winter weather still lingers throughout our North State, and big changes are coming our way. We'll tell you everything you need to know tonight. But good evening. Thanks for joining us at 6:30. I am Dylan Brown. Let's go straight to the weather center. Very active radar. I'm seeing Ooh. behind. First, let me draw just uh, Brian Schofield tonight. What do you have for us, Brian? Active in Redding, that's for sure. It's light rain, but nevertheless, we expected a little quick one for uh, this evening. We talked about it yesterday, just to give you an idea that there's still a little more energy left, not quite out of the area yet. In the city of Shasta Lake, getting some light showers and of course some snow with that as well. But uh, that's out to Weaverville, out to French Gulch. It's really all starting to come together and it really will make an impact for tomorrow. See, there's a low up to the north, even though we kind of had the last gasp of winter. This is still a cold system right here. You interact that with some wet weather, that, that the atmospheric river that's coming in. It is going to make a difference in how things pull together. And the timing of it's important because all of this disappears. You can see for tonight, but it's tomorrow morning that we start to really ramp up the chance for rain and certainly some upper elevation snow. That'll just be great to see across the valley, but maybe not great to see in areas that have seen so much snow already. So we're just getting some more rain. We know we've been wanting moisture, but so much more of it. And even thunderstorms are on the way with wind, with big mountain snow. We'll get the timing down for you coming up in your first alert forecast just ahead. All right, we better be ready for it. Thank you so much, Brian. Town of Hayfork, like the rest of Trinity County, is bundling up and, pre and prepping their fireplaces or snowmobiles for more snow expected to arrive in the area tomorrow, which naturally prompted us to check in with those who live out there, uh, see if they're ready or prepared. We spoke with one local business owner. He says that while he's personally prepared for the frosty elements, his business may not be. I'm at a high elevation, there's no big deal. We make sure the generators got fuel, uh, there's no oil changes needed, and other than that, we just wait it out. When it snows, half the time we can get a little bit of business, but most of the time it just turns into a snail's pace and it just comes to a screeching halt. Someone else who was towing a snowmobile said he'd be ready to play in the snow when it comes. Hey, if you look for more hyper local, more detailed weather information, you can download our KRCR weather app from your phone's app store. You'll get instant weather alerts and advisories, as well as access to up to the radar so you can track the conditions in your own neighborhood. Well, First District State Assembly member Megan Dowley of Beaver has announced she's given up her seat to run for state senate, hoping to succeed her husband Brian, who's up against term limits now. Mike Mangus has the story. That creates an opening for assembly. And the first candidate to announce her intention to fill that seat is Anderson City Councilwoman Melissa Hunt. The 16-year council member says she's looking to bring some common sense to Sacramento. I'm a conservative voice. I've been on the Anderson City Council since 07, and Anderson is thriving now. We are, I love my city. We're doing great things in Anderson. And I want to take that experience that I've got from Anderson and take it to the Sacramento, take, take it to Sacramento for the state. We need to make some changes and it's gonna be exciting. Her top priorities are familiar, forest management, homelessness, drugs, and public safety. Homeless has multifacets of it. There is the fentanyl ap epidemic. We have to attend to that. And then on top of that, um, okay. Newsom has closed our prisons. A lot of these people are from the prisons and they don't have anywhere to go and they're addicted. We need mental health to deal with that and we need to open up some of the prisons so we can get the people that are in our jails that have terms that are supposed to be served in a prison, we need to get them back to the prison. And then that, on top of that would open up our, our jails and give our local law enforcement more room for the local offenders. As Mike Mangus reported, the primary elections about a year from now. First district includes Shasta, Modoc, and Siskiyou counties, then wraps right along the Nevada border into the gold country. Well, let's look live right now at the Gateway District Board Room in Reading. The latest on the search for a fifth 
board member there. Reporter Sam Committee has been covering this meeting since it started around 5 p.m. You're looking live from Chief Photographer Adam McAllister, who's out there. He just sent an email McAllister did right when our show came on air saying that public comment has just ended. You can see uh, Area 3 board member Lindsey Haynes speaking. The board publicly interviewing people for their open board seat. This, of course, comes after former board president Cheryl Clifford resigned early last month. Gateway's remaining board members do not have to make a decision today, but they said they hope to come to some sort of consensus tonight. We're going to be tracking this. Have more for you later on on the 7 at 7, a full breakdown also later tonight at 10 on Fox and 11 right here on ABC. Well, NorCal Outreach, a local nonprofit working with LGBTQ plus youth, met with Shasta County School Board to address their concerns, share experiences, and overall state of how they feel the LGBTQ plus community, a uh, student community is supported through their district. The Shasta County School District met with NorCal Outreach along with other community members earlier this afternoon. Outreach members sharing their experiences of growing up in the same district and expressed the need to support the LGBTQ plus students, as well as addressed why they feel representation is important to have within their schools. Clayton Seaborn spoke with us about why he feels the need to advocate for students in the community. I'm hoping to show the board um, isolation that an LGBTQ child feels. It's devastating. Um, I personally didn't think anybody else in the world was like me, and it drove me to attempt suicide five times, um, starting in junior high. And I don't want any child to go through that. Seaborn added that he aims to share his testimony with the school board as a sort of way to urge the school district to encourage students to use what pronouns they want, as well as providing students a part of the LGBTQ community with resources and outlets. NorCal Outreach say that they've had great relationships with school districts in the past and just hope to provide more of an outlook on those in the LGBTQ plus community. Up next, a new flesh rotting street drop expected to make its way to our North State. You didn't know about it. That's coming up next. The time right now, 636. I'm Dylan Brown. This is your North State News. The man arrested for shaking his baby appeared in court today on Saturday. Ready police arresting this man, Frankie Lee Cooley, for child abuse after he admitted to violently shaking his two-month-old infant. Today, he was arraigned for child abuse, having a prior strike conviction and other allegations. His bail set at $100,000. His preliminary hearing set for March 16th. The number of U.S. infants who died from opioid overdoses, it's on the rise. It's according to a study published today in the Pediatrics Journal. 731 children under the age of five died of a drug-related death from 2005 through 2018. Researchers say some of these deaths came from the use of over-the-counter medications. The majority of those fatal poisonings from opioids. The study doesn't really say how these children were able to get their hands on the drugs, but does note that more than 40% of them were accidental overdoses. Well, a brand new flesh rotting street drop is fueling overdose deaths across the nation recently. And although it did start somewhere else, Butte County drug agents say it's only a matter of time before it hits our North State. Tyler Van Dyke has a story. On the streets, it's known as zombie drug or trank. Xylazine is supposed to be used as an animal tranquilizer. Now it's being found in street drugs and officials say it can rot the skin around injection sites. It's even being found in fentanyl, which as we know is a highly addictive drug that has ravaged the country and the North state very hard in the last few years. Consistently it's, it's been um, rising. You know, we've seen those, those numbers, particularly when you look at overdose deaths. Related to fentanyl, absolutely, we have seen a, a sharp curve. I don't have all that data yet, um, but I would anticipate, uh, again, another increase. Butte Interagency Narcotics Task Force Commander Michael O'Brien says fentanyl has been a problem in Butte County for several years. It's been a problem for several years now, and uh, like I said, it's not going away anytime soon. What makes fentanyl mixed with trank especially dangerous is its resistance to Narcan the medication used to treat overdoses. That's what makes it dangerous is it has a lot of the effects of the, you know, the opioids as far as suppressing different uh, systems in the body which cause overdose and death. 
And we do not have, that I'm aware of at least, uh, um, in the hands of first responders, an antidote to that like we do with opioids and naloxone. Although it started somewhere else, O'Brien is aware that it will show up in the North State. You know what's coming and it may already be here. It's something that all of us, not just in law enforcement, but public health, the County Department of Public Health are pay, paying very close attention to. Reporting for the North State's News, I'm Tyler Van Dyke. Looking to the satellite radar composite, most of the moisture still up to the north in Redding. We're not seeing much down south through Orland or Chico or Oroville, but that will change for tomorrow. We'll have that timing for you coming up in your first look forecast. Plus, it's National Adoption Week. Take a look at some local organizations helping pets find their forever homes. We'll be right back. So I'm driving Redding is teamed up with Haven Humane Society today, kicking off PetSmart's National Adoption Week. Welcoming nine dogs, four cats, all available for adoption and looking for their forever home. Haven Humane Society telling us that these events are just one of the many ways they can support the community. Director of Operations says that they're doing their best to open up space at the shelter. And today's dog adoptions are just $25. So we, we always hope for a great turnout and a lot of adoptions. Um, if we don't do those, then we still like to be out in the community, remind people that we exist and we're here um, and we have lots of dogs available. Um, you know, because of COVID and everything else that's happened in the last four years, um, we really had to take a step back from doing outreaches. And um, now it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to be back out in the community and doing them again. All right, hosting a truckload of furry friends are all available for, for adoption from 11 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. That's going to be through Friday at PetSmart on Hilltop. If you can't make it on Saturday, Haven is having another adoption event at the Starbucks in Anderson. And speaking of, it's time to chime. We're combining pets and weather in this one. Some amazing picks. Look at these two pups enjoying the snow. This is Pearl and the Dude, submitted by Victoria Howe. Greatest name ever for a pup. Also submitted by Victoria, though, this is Phineas, the snow cat. Bet you don't see that every day. Looks like he's enjoying the winter weather. But how long is this cold weather sticking around? Let's go to the Weather Center. Back to first wave meteorologist. Brian, uh, it, tracking that and more. Brian. I'll tell you. It's the first time we've ever heard uh, people say snowing cats and dogs. Usually it's raining no. cats and dogs. We're seeing that now. Okay, <laughs> all right. How about blowing those cats and dogs into the point? Look at this. We're getting wind out of the bargain, too. I'm going to start with that, but we know flooding's a concern, snow's a concern. It really all is a concern. We're getting just so much coming together, but we could see, oh, easily gust 40, even beyond that, 50 miles an hour. And, of course, the flood watch in effect. There's already a winter storm warning uh, through uh, tomorrow and Friday and for the Sierra extending all the way to Sunday. So that's just ongoing, and that means there'll be strong wind there. But valley winds, oh, yeah, you better believe that. And uh, heavy rain with the snow melt, yeah, and some of it, that doesn't melt. Yeah, a lot of runoff there as well. That's Thursday through Sunday as well, area wide. So we've just got to keep our eyes to the skies. So it's interesting because we're interacting uh, a cold storm, really, and not as cold as what was, has come through already, but certainly from a cold source region with a warm source region. The combination of the two puts that moisture and that energy onshore here. So that's what's going to really change up the forecast and make it even more interesting. I think the uh, warmer uh, air is certainly going to win out. I think most people can agree on that, especially when we're seeing that atmospheric river push in. But there comes a little point where they both come together. And when we see them come together, boy, this computer model really wants to bring in some low snow. But for the most part, it's staying in the upper elevations. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about flooding. And certainly for the weekend, uh, the elevations, the snow levels get higher and higher as more of this warm, moist, uh, unstable air comes into the fray. So we'll be watching that closely with a more valley rain down to the south through Chico and Willows and Oroville and uh, certainly seeing some mountain snow continue. You can see by hour by hour, we're right there, even into the evening hours for tomorrow. It looks like a very rainy day across the area. So plenty of moisture to work with into the evening hours. Not getting a whole lot of a break, maybe a few breaks in the early morning hours where we keep some of that in, some of it not so much in the, the picture. Several inches of rain as well coming out of this. And then finally a break uh, for before late morning, let's say, across the area. And then you can see that we do pretty well thereafter. So we just have to kind of wait through early Saturday. We're fine, and then we're going to bring in the next round through 
Quick look at our uh, rainfall totals, which really are Goliath. These are only for two days. We're not even counting Saturday and Sunday in this, so I don't want to confuse everyone too many numbers, but here are some more numbers, actually. Some overnight lows right there in the upper 30s, 40s or so. So a little more mild tonight with the cloud cover and the moisture. Uh, windy conditions uh, really push through the area through Friday. We spring forward as well. So do the temperatures. The temperatures are springing up as well. Overnight lows have come up quite a bit. Afternoon highs. Through Chico, we're seeing those 60s pop up for next week. No surprise. That should just show you how gradually more mild this air gets and winds out in the end over the colder air. Certainly, that's just left over from these cold storms that were out of the Gulf of Alaska. So, subtropical moisture in the picture won't make it feel tropical, but will certainly push up snow levels and bring down some more rain across the valley. Now, here's your weather window. Weather window presented by the National Weather Desk. People in northern Michigan woke up Tuesday morning to these snow rollers. They form when strong winds blow snow that isn't compacted, but rather loose with temperatures near freezing. If the wind is too strong, they just rip apart. And one week after the Las Vegas area saw a rare March snowstorm, this beautiful sunrise started the day. Highs were expected in the mid-60s. For more content like this, follow the National Weather Desk on Instagram. With wet weather in our forecast, state water officials might be gearing up to release water through the main spillway at the Orville Dam. Manasonic reports. The reconstructed spillway at the Orville Dam could be put to work as early as this Friday. It would be the first time it's been used since April of 2019. With rain and snow on the horizon, water officials will be increasing outflows because they expect more runoff into the reservoir. They say they only anticipate a small spill at Lake Oroville, but that the spillway is good to go nonetheless. It's now equipped with devices underneath the spillway to monitor seepage, as well as surveillance cameras. For local officials, other concerns are more front of mind as the storm comes in. I think that the project was built for water delivery, and the culture of, of uh, DWR is around that, that they believe that they need to deliver as much water as they can to other users, including the environment. Locally, we would like to see them protect us by keeping the lake down to bring in any uh, emergency need, such as warm rain on snow, uh, which there is a potential for that with this large snowpack. Right now, the lake is at over 70 percent of its total capacity. That's 116 percent of the historical average. DWR says current outflows are being used to support local water needs and maintain flood control. Well, DWR couldn't be reached for a comment on this story, but we know they are required to maintain enough storage to account for these changes in the weather. Uh, and we'll have more for you at KRCRTV.com. Up next, some lawmakers trying to ban a social media app that millions use every day, a Sinclair report that's at the break. And later in our 7 at 7 cover story, three years after the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, lawmakers trying to get to the bottom of where everything began. It's later tonight. Let's stick around. Million Americans are using the popular video app TikTok, but some lawmakers on Capitol Hill, they want that to drop to zero. Sinclair's chief political correspondent Scott Thuman explains. An app causing angst on Capitol Hill. A dozen senators from both parties unveiling a bill to give President Biden the power to ban TikTok and other foreign produced technologies. The old definition of national security, which was planes, tanks, and guns, is morphing into who controls and wins the technology battle. Including software from Russia, Iran, North Korea, and other adversaries with access to users' personal information. It's safe to assume that if the CCP is willing to lie about its spy balloon and cover up the origins of the worst pandemic in 100 years, they'll lie about using TikTok to spy on American citizens. The heads of intelligence agencies touching on those chances during testimony Wednesday on worldwide threats. When I came in the Army in 1984, we, we own uh, the technology, the West owned the technology. We won the Cold War, and then, and then I think we took our eye off that ball. 
Elsewhere, Texas lawmakers are fine-tuning legislation to limit China and several other countries from buying up farmland. The bill, originally condemned by Asian American groups as discriminatory, now being softened a bit, and China's stake is much smaller than more than a dozen other countries. But many worry that will grow if allowed. This is part of a long-term strategic plan by the Chinese to seize control over uh, food and, and, frankly, in other cases, uh, health care and medicine as well. Meanwhile, others reporting that Chinese-connected groups and companies have even donated large amounts of money to a prestigious high school outside of Washington, D.C. Watchdog groups call it influence peddling. Back to TikTok, the White House signaling its support for that bill that lawmakers want passed urgently, and President Biden also giving federal agencies 30 days to wipe the app from government devices. On Capitol Hill, I'm Scott Thuman. The Federal Trade Commission has launched an investigation into Twitter's privacy practices recently. This move coming after a House subcommittee disclosed a dozen letters from the FTC to Twitter looking for information about the company's operations under its new leader, Elon Musk. It marks a very rare public confirmation of a probe linked to alleged violations of an FTC settlement, which was designed to force the company to improve its protection of user data. According to the report, the FTC also wants testimony from Twitter about staffing changes due to resignations and firings after Musk ended up taking over the company. Up next, opening a bottle of sunshine. Now for adults, too. Sunny D launching a vodka seltzer. Stick around. We'll back. Sack, listen to grunge or tie a plaid t shirt around your waist. This <laughs> what could brighten your day? How do you know me so well? <laughs> you do that every day with my Zima. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Zima, <laughs> get bring, out of here. Bring him back to the old school. Sunny D launching a vodka seltzer, just like you. Sunny D, the highly advertised orange drink from the 90s, is all grown up now. Company says they were inspired by people telling them they like to use Sunny D as a mixer. I've never heard one person tell me that. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Sunny D will be available at select Walmart stores starting March 11th. You remember in those commercials, Sunny D? There's always that purple stuff, too. That goes, oh, you want this, the purple stuff? Sunny D. Sunny D's the yeah, way to go. So in the, the fridge, purple stuff I happen to like. They're reaching for grape juice and they grab Sunny right, D. Right, right, right. But those were kids. Kids do not touch this yeah, at all. It's not for you. Not if you're wrapping around your waist with the flannel. Is the, that what the it is? The plaid shirt. <laughs> Quick look. Tomorrow we got it. Heavy rain. We're pulling out snow in the upper elevations. That's going to be nuts. Snow in the upper elevations. All right. We'll be coming back at you this 7 at 7. We appreciate you. Drink responsibly. Seven at seven weather making its way to our north state, taking it by storm, rain, snow, winds all sticking around. We've got the latest weather updates and our cover story of the night. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill asking the million dollar question. Where did COVID-19 start? Expert opinions and more. Plus a national organization providing veterans with free marijuana. It's called Weed for Warriors. We'll tell you all about it. All that and more starts right now. This is the 7 at 7 on KRCR, the North State's News. Well, good evening. Happy hump day to you. Welcome to the 7 at 7. I'm Dylan Brown. As we make our way through the week, we have more winter weather whipping up. It's getting kind of wicked out there. Weather advisories in some places and parts of our North State. We're headed straight to the Weather Center. First, let meteorologist Brian Schofield tracking that and more tonight. That's where we start with our top seven stories of the night. I'll tell you, these winter storms keep sticking around. We'll be calling them spring storms, that's for sure, because we're getting closer to spring all the time. I want to show you Caltrans cameras right there, uh, Interstate 5. Some are dark, but just to give you an idea that everything's flowing nicely. Things are looking pretty good. I mean, you know, 2,500 foot level, 35 and Fondale right there. Everything's flowing. There's only been rain around Redding and uh, certainly some snow up to the north uh, throughout. Looks like the city of Shasta Lake, up to Lakehead as well. Trinity Center looks like getting a little dusting close by. So this is stuff that we're watching, but really there's a bigger picture that we're keeping our eyes on. It's what's slowly making its way in, and this low is going to be part of it, but but the moisture down to the, from the south is going to be a bigger part. And this precision cast pulls out that little bit we're getting in Redding and pulls in all of this that's coming in. I'll give you the timing as we get into the full forecast, and that's coming up in your first alert weather. The reconstructed spillway at the Oroville Dam could be put to work as early as this Friday. It would be the first time it's been used since April of 2019. 
With rain and snow on the horizon, water officials will be increasing outflows because they expect more runoff into the reservoir. They say they only anticipate a small spill at Lake Oroville, but that the spillway is good to go nonetheless. It's now equipped with devices underneath the spillway to monitor seepage, as well as surveillance cameras. For local officials, other concerns are more front of mind as the storm comes in. I think that the project was built for water delivery, and the culture of, of uh, DWR is around that, that they believe that they need to deliver as much water as they can to other users, including the environment. Locally, we would like to see them protect us by keeping the lake down to bring in any uh, emergency need, such as warm rain on snow, uh, which there is a potential for that with this large snowpack. Right now, the lake is at over 70 percent of its total capacity. That's 116 percent of the historical average. DWR says current outflows are being used to support local water needs and maintain flood control. That creates an opening for assembly. And the first candidate to announce her intention to fill that seat is Anderson City Councilwoman Melissa Hunt. The 16-year council member says she's looking to bring some common sense to Sacramento. I'm a conservative voice. I've been on the Anderson City Council since 07, and Anderson is thriving now. We are, I love my city. We're doing great things in Anderson. And I want to take that experience that I've got from Anderson and take it to the Sacramento Take, take it to Sacramento for the state. We need to make some changes and it's going to be exciting. Her top priorities are familiar. Forest management, homelessness, drugs, and public safety. Homeless has multifacets of it. There is the fentanyl ap epidemic. We have to attend to that. And then on top of that, um, okay. Newsom has closed our prisons. A lot of these people are from the prisons and they don't have anywhere to go and they're addicted. We need mental health to deal with that and we need to open up some of the prisons so we can get the people that are in our jails that have terms that are supposed to be served in a prison, we need to get them back to the prison. And then that, on top of that would open up our, our jails and give our local law enforcement more room for the local offenders. Well, happening right now in Shasta County, the Gateway Unified School District holding that special board meeting. The four current trustees interviewed in open session. Six candidates for their vacant board position, which was created in early February, back when President Cheryl Clifford resigned amid ongoing controversy. Gateway officials we spoke with earlier say they want to make a decision and fill the seat tonight. The question is, can a consensus be reached? Clock is ticking for Gateway. If a replacement isn't appointed by early April, Shasta County's Office of Education will have to hold a special election to fill the role. Trustees are discussing the candidates right now. We'll bring you the final verdict from the meeting later tonight on KRCR News. NorCal Outreach met with Shasta County School Board to address their concerns, share experiences, and overall state how they feel the LGBTQ plus student community is supported through the district. I spoke with office manager of NorCal Outreach on why this meeting is necessary and why it's happening now. The Shasta County School Board met with NorCal Outreach along with other community members earlier this afternoon. Outreach members shared their experiences growing up in the same district and expressed the need for support for LGBTQ plus students. Clayton Seaborn spoke with me about why he feels the need to advocate for students in the community. Isolation that an LGBTQ child feels it's devastating. Um, I personally didn't think anybody else in the world was like me, and it drove me to attempt suicide five times, uh, starting in junior high. And I don't want any child to go through that. Norca Outreach told me that they have had great relationships with school districts in the past and just hope to provide more of an outlook on those in the LGBTQ plus community. Reporting in Reading, Anna Montemore, The North State's News. Getting that message out there that they're not alone in this. Veterans lined up outside the high times in Shasta Lake for a Weed Fort Warriors event, which provided 40 veterans with two and a half ounces of cannabis products worth more than $100 and all free of charge. We see you, we appreciate you, and here's how we can show it. 
Tour manager Brody Wilborn says this is a great opportunity for them to honor veterans as well as get them help. We have a resource for you and we also have organizations that are willing to guide you towards good like entities that are designed to help just veterans. This event was also sponsored by PAX and the local company Ember Valley. Ember Valley employee Jeremy Sample says it means a lot to him to be able to help local veterans, just like his father, who is a Navy veteran. So it's an honor for them to serve those who served our country. It really brings such joy to my to my life. Um, you know, seeing seeing the tears shed, seeing that smiling faces, seeing the positive vibes that normally in, in the veteran community they don't they don't feel um, is something that is very very important to to not only me but Ember Valley. Reporting in Shasta County, Mason Carroll, the North States News. Well, it is International Women's Day. We wanted to highlight some ready woman-owned businesses. According to the National Women's Business Council, 42% of all U.S. businesses are owned by women, and women-owned businesses employ more than 9.4 million workers. Floranthropist is a flower shop and boutique in downtown Reading, founded by Katie Walder, recently expanded, splitting the two sides between two different storefronts. Her friend and co-worker, Ruth Atkins, says it's amazing to work at a woman-owned business and they hope to also inspire more women to become entrepreneurs. If you're interested in supporting Floranthropist, uh, both storefronts are located on Market Street in downtown Reading. We got a lot more coming tonight on the 7 at 7. The hot celeb goss continues to boil over here in America. Vander Punch rules? What? Or on that much trending. And look at live over Reading, our Hasrud Law Sky Cam. Wild weather's headed our way. Pretty cold precipitation is going to be pounding our pavements here soon. First, let me all just Brian Schofield's tracking that and more. Uh, the time right now, 7.08. I'm Dylan Brown. This is Jordan Moore State News. TV.com and check out in case you missed it tonight. Up first in Glynn County, a man died after crashing his plane into an orchard. Officials with the sheriff's office said it happened near Highway 162, County Road BB. They say the pilot, Peter Man of Willows, flew into high voltage transmission lines, essentially killed in the crash. No other passengers were inside the plane at the time. The cause of the crash is under investigation. We'll continue to keep you updated on air and online as we learn more. And of course, the other unfortunate news in Butte County, a woman died from her injuries in a pileup crash that happened on Highway 99 just outside of Chico yesterday. CHP officers say around Three, a woman was driving her Toyota sedan north on Highway 99 near Cana Highway when for unknown reason she veered into oncoming traffic, crashing into a big rig. The crash caused the rear axle of the trailer to detach, which traveled into the northbound lane, hitting a Toyota pickup truck, causing it to roll over. The axle then crossed back into the southbound lanes where it collided with another Honda sedan. The woman driving the Toyota sedan, though, taken it in low hospital with serious injuries, she would later die. Her identity withheld until families notified CHP was investigating the cause of the initial crash. In Trinity County, a man arrested after he crashed his car in Trinity, then committed another string of crimes. CHP says he was under the influence the whole time. Started Friday near Highway 299 Trinity Dam Boulevard. Officers say the man crashed while under the influence, stole a car, crashed through a locked metal gate, then tampered with a tractor trailer near Buckhorn Summit. CHP says he took off from the scene ran away from officers. They would find him near the big rig. He was arrested, booked into Trinity County Jail. The Highway Patrol did not give out his name. Remember, you can find all that more. Get all the day's news anytime you want. It's easy to do with our KRCR News Channel 7 News app. All you got to do is just search KRCR in your device's app store. On that device is the thing called the Internet. Very interesting part of the device. Let's find out what's trending on that tonight. Up first, of course, we told you a bit about it earlier, local, but let's look larger with it. International Women's Day. And you know what was trending? Pictures with stories of women who accomplished everything with almost everything pushing against them. Whether in the past, present, even future, according to the International Women's Day website today, a day to celebrate women's achievements, raise awareness about discrimination. Marches are usually held globally, and we saw that. I Love Women was also trending. Let's go. And Kenny, that's the name for these two. At least that's what I say it is. Let's dive for, forehead first into the hottest of gossip to exist. Sweet, sweet goss. Kendall Jenner, Bad Bunny, spotted kissing this week. The rumored romance is no longer speculation. Captured hugging and kissing and romanticizing. Love is in the air, but people weren't too happy about it. They say there might be a curse when it comes to Jenners and musical artists. Bad Bunny's other name is Benito, and no Benito No was trending along with their two names. 
But hey, go ahead and do, do what you got to do. Uh, hold on, is this Hot Celeb Goss Part 2? Is there another bowl of chicken noodles and who? Uh, what are we feasting on? Vanderpump Rules. I told you yesterday, Raquel Levis allegedly had an affair with Ariana Maddox's man, Tom Sandoval. Well, the reality castmate, Shiana Shea, allegedly attacked Levis last Thursday in New York. Supposedly, Shiana shoved Raquel against a brick wall, punched her in her left eye. Now Raquel has a temporary restraining order against her. It's also while Raquel has been sending out letters from her lawyer saying the fact that they posted her and Tom making out online could be illegal in California. More like Vander Punch rules, am I right? How did you keep all that straight? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I what? <laughs> it's difficult, I'll be honest with you. Not too easy. What else are we seeing you tonight? It. I can keep this organized. Uh, rain, thunderstorm, certainly a, a good bet for tomorrow. Uh, windy at times and more big mountain snow. We'll have the timing coming up. There we go. I like it. We'll come back to you. Plus, three years after the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, lawmakers trying to get down to the bottom of where everything began. Don't make a move. That's coming up this. Super. up. We just got this in from Caltrans. They say westbound SR44 Dana Drive off ramp is closed. This is in Reading, Shasta County. They say this is due to a vehicle collision. We don't know how serious if there are any injuries in this at all, but they have closed down the off ramp. They say a detour is available and you're asked to use an alternate route if you can. We're getting an article up right now. Tell your loved ones, anyone's heading that area, let them know what's going on. Well, uh, looking larger on Capitol Hill, a brand new subcommittee held its first hearing today to ask one fundamental question. Where did COVID-19 come from? National correspondent Christine Frizzell reports in our cover story of the night. Three years, multiple variants, and 6.8 million worldwide deaths, yet still no definitive answers on the origins of COVID-19. When a small handful of us uh, in the earliest days of the pandemic began raising the possibility of uh, a possible lab origin. There was just, as I said, ferociously strong headwinds. At a hearing looking into the origins of COVID-19, Dr. Jamie Metzl and others pointed to this paper, apparently edited by Dr. Anthony Fauci, which argued the viewpoint that became prevalent, that the virus came from an animal host before zoonotic transfer, reiterating, quote, we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. Three years ago, if you thought it came from a lab, if you raised that, you were called a nut job, you got censored on Twitter, you were blacklisted on Twitter. I think the most upsetting thing to me was the uh, Baltimore Sun calling me a racist because I said this came from a Wuhan lab. It's a point of view now backed by both the FBI and the Department of Energy. Still, some also blamed former President Trump, laying out multiple examples of him praising Chinese President Xi Jinping for his, quote, transparency and hard work on the pandemic. For telling Americans that COVID would magically disappear at Easter time, or everybody should just take hydroxychloroquine, or refusing to wear a mask, or never developing a national plan to defeat the disease. Lawmakers in both parties did emphasize the need to follow the facts and that many of those facts remain unavailable because China has been aggressively blocking access to locations and information that could help. In Washington, I'm Christine Frizzau. All right, switching gears a bit now. Let's go right to the weather center. An active week weather-wise, I'll say. That's a, a, putting it soft. Truly. Too. Let's go back over to Brian, who's tracking that more. What do you see in Brian? Show you some temperatures that are still on the cool side today, but a little more mild than yesterday and tomorrow will be a little cooler than today as we get more of that rainfall in the picture. But just thought I'd show you those first. Of course, wind speeds. We've seen some breezes today, but not the strong gusts that we're going to see tomorrow afternoon, evening into early Friday. Uh, let me show you those. I'm going to show uh, pretty impressive stuff. We know along the coast we're getting those 50 mile per hour winds closer to valley areas. You can see the 4 p.m. hour for tomorrow. They really start to surge up 30, 40. But watch as we get through the uh, evening hours, see 50 mile per hour gusts, not out of the question. 
So keep that in mind for tomorrow when you're out and about. The evening hour is going to be really touch and go. And then we see it just kind of wind down for later on for Friday. So the wind won't be the biggest factor coming in. This storm will be, although this it really stays mostly to the north, but the interaction of that and some warm, moist, unstable air coming into the picture is really going to put things uh, into very interesting levels here. So we'll be watching it closely, as you can see, uh, as it all pushes in, and there's plenty of snow to be had from this. This is not devoid of snow just because the warmer source region will keep a lot of rain in the picture as well. And you can see it just doesn't look like it quits for tomorrow. Not too many breaks, except maybe late tomorrow night, a few spots. But for the most part, we keep that snow in. We keep that rain in the picture. And it lasts through, uh, looks like uh, early Friday. You can see there are some better breaks there. So that just shows you how it starts to get a little more ragged. And then by late morning, it's out of the picture. Uh, and then we get uh, Friday afternoon, evening into Saturday. But here's a long range just to give you an idea that cold air spins out. And we're still drawing up all of that moisture from the south. So these storms are well fed. There's another big batch coming in for early next week. And that's what really helps keep these things going. So that's why we're watching them so closely. Show you some rainfall estimates. And I'm doing it just for a couple of days worth because really we're adding almost an extra inch to these if we go through Sunday with this. So it's impressive stuff to see several inches of rainfall. And we've had systems like this. This is not the most unusual atmospheric river we've seen. But the fact that we're now getting them on the backside of some cold lows makes a big difference in how much snow we'll get across the area. So we've got the 30s overnight, some 20s in the upper elevations. This morning was pretty mild. We'll do that again. Pretty mild compared to what you could be getting, I suppose, overnight. But more mild as we get into uh, the weekend and next week as you see those overnight lows come up as well. Uh, we're springing forward. That's, that would probably be a bigger story if we didn't have the wind coming in for Thursday and Friday, maybe even some thunderstorms as well. Keeping it all into perspective, it's really about rain and snow and strong wind across the area. And that's why there's a flood watch in effect because you just add that up and it's a lot of runoff, a lot of ponding of the roadways, a lot of debris flows as well. So just keep that in mind and travel certainly to the upper elevations is not recommended or you have to be extra careful if you do, if you know exactly where you're going, because certainly there'll be plenty of snow to be had measured in feet once again, not necessarily inches. And that's all the way out to Lake Tahoe and back westward. We're talking to Weaverville. We're talking lower elevations than that, uh, picking up some snowfall as well. But those 60s pop up, maybe that'll make things feel a little better. Back to you. Just a little better. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Let's look at entertainment news tonight. Uh, in a social media post, Bindi Irwin revealed she's been suffering with endometriosis. That's right, she actually posted that on social media, a condition in which the tissue that normally lines the uterus grows outside the uterus. It causes pelvic pain, heavy bleeding during periods, and fertility issues. Irwin's post is accompanied by an image of her in a hospital bed. 24-year-old said doctors found 37 lesions, some of which were, quote, very deep and difficult to remove. But the mother of one says she's on her way to recovery. Erwin is just the latest celebrity opening up about struggles with endometriosis. Uh, comedians Amy Schumer, Lena Dunham, and actress Padma Lakshmi have all talked about their battle with the disease. We'll be right back. Another look right now. Chief photographer Adam McAllister made his way out here. This is 44 SR 44 westbound near Dana Drive. They have that off ramp this is all from Caltrans currently closed. Um, all we know right now is that there is a vehicle crash out there so far. A vehicle collision. They have a detour available for you if you need it. Motorists are advised. They say to use an alternate route. Uh, McAllister went out there. He snapped this about five to ten minutes ago and said that he saw out there a vehicle on its side, uh, hearing extrication possibly needed and potential patients involved in this. And you can see several agencies are working this as well. So this is again westbound SR 44 near Dana Drive. That off ramp is going to be closed for quite some time. We'll keep track. We'll keep you up to date at CaresHearTV.com. Well, let's, let's feel good. Let's feel a little good. Let's get to our moment of the day. An NFL star helped save a person trapped inside a burning car in Austin, Texas Sunday. Yeah, Minnesota Vikings wide receiver KJ Osborne posting this picture on Twitter of himself and three others who rescued a man after his vehicle crashed and went up in flames. 25 year old was riding in an Uber when he spotted the accident. That's when he, the Uber driver and two others pulled the man out of his car, carried him to safety and waited with him until help could get there. Osborne, who's training in Austin, said he's been in contact with the man and he and the three other people who helped saved him plan to visit him at the hospital. 
football get you? He tackled the car. Said, right. get, let's get at it. You got all the right moves. Let's there it is. <laughs> Take a look quickly. Oh, we got it all tomorrow. Got wind, we got rain, got some snow. Oh boy, it's gonna be a busy day and temperatures cool down quite a bit tomorrow, too, into the 40s. Man, snow on snow for our upper elevations. They've been seeing a lot of it. Mount Shasta, we're looking at you. Uh, we'll have more for you weather-wise coming up tonight at 10 on Fox 11 ABC. We appreciate you, North State.